Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my September reading wrap-up. So as I did it last month, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, basically film, almost like vlog style, a couple of books at a time just to make sure that I don't forget stuff and I can review them when they're fresh in my mind. It's actually the 1st of September right now, and I've finished two books this month already. So the first I finished is... Uh, Veg Every Day by Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. So this is a vegetarian cookbook. I'm actually vegan, but you can quite easily veganize a lot of the vegetarian stuff by switching out some of the ingredients. So for example, milk for plant-based milk, cream, cheese, all that kind of stuff. And Hugh Fernley Whittingstall is a fairly well-known sort of celebrity chef here in the UK. I actually picked this up. It's got a one pound sticker on from a charity shop, but it was actually two bucks for a pound. So uh, I saved a decent chunk of money on this one and just picked it up on a whim and it turned out to be really good. Now by far my favourite recipe in this was probably the herby peanutty uh, noodle salad which was delicious but there are lots of other great ones in here. All your starters, mains, desserts etc etc. Some of them weren't so good and some of them I didn't try like there were loads of soups in this. I mean it's about 400 10, 20 pages or something like that long so there's plenty of recipes in it and I've cooked many of these on my reading vlogs and also you know one or two of them I think have featured on my uh, vegan YouTube channel Dane's Vegan Journey so check that out as well all in all I was very happy with this and I gave it a 4 out of 5 definitely worth picking up especially if you can get it cheap if you have to pay full price maybe not so much and then I read Haruki Murakami, Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. This was actually a book that Biggie picked out for me as part of my, my Cat Picks My TBR series. And to start with, this was a bedtime book for me. I was reading it a little bit at a time because really I had no idea what was going on. Even by the end of the book, I still didn't have that much of an idea of what was going on. It was kind of magical realism, quite psychedelic in places. It reminded me of Stephen King's Dark Tower books, but it also reminded me of like Neuromancer by William Gibson. So you know, take that, take that as you will. It's probably my fourth Murakami now, and I don't know, I always enjoy his stuff, but I always feel kind of relieved to have finished it as well. With this one, actually, I probably could have gone for another 100 pages or so, so even though it is like one of those reads where you have to concentrate to know what's going on, it's worth the concentration and it does eventually repay you for it as well. So as I say, I started it as a bedtime read and eventually moved it on to my, uh, my main pile. I couldn't even really tell you what it's about here. I mean, let, well, let me read you the blurb, actually. Why not? This will give you a better description of it than I could. A narrative particle accelerator that zooms between wild turkey whiskey and Bob Dylan, unicorn schools and voracious librarians, John Coltrane and Lord Jim. Science fiction, detective story and postmodern manifesto all rolled into one rip-roaring novel. Hard-boiled Wonderland and the End of the World is the tour de force that expanded Haruki Murakami's international following. Tracking one man's descent into the Kafkaesque underworld of contemporary Tokyo, Murakami unites East and West, tragedy and farce, compassion and detachment, slang and philosophy. There is always a wildly inventive fantasy and a meditation on the many uses of the mind. Pretty good blurb for what it is. I mean, it doesn't really explain what happens because you kind of can't. You just have to read it. It's nuts, but in a good way. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. Uh, yeah. Alright, so I have another book to update you on, and that is Sharda, a Doctor Who novel by Douglas Adams and Gareth Roberts. And basically, from what I understand, I think Adams wrote the script for this episode that's like a lost episode of Doctor Who. And this novel is either written just by Gareth Roberts or maybe by Adams and Roberts. I'm not entirely sure how that works out. Um, but you can definitely feel Adams' voice in it. It feels a lot like you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy meets Doctor Who, really. There's even one line in it where he referred to uh, Beetlejuice as a language, which I believe is from the Hitchhiker's Guide. And so that was pretty interesting. It was a lot easier to read than I was expecting, actually. I mean, I'm not a massive Doctor Who fan, and this Doctor is... I don't even know which Doctor it was. It was one before I ever even watched Doctor Who. So that kind of made it easy for me. I just read it as a novel and imagined him how I wanted to. And yeah, it was pretty cool. The main story kind of focuses on this super powerful book, which was cool. It's set in Cambridge, so that was also interesting. And it was just a really easy read. It just took me like 48 hours, so I don't know why I put it off for so long. I gave it a pretty solid 3.75 out of 5. And I would recommend to anyone who's either a Douglas Adams fan or anyone who's a Doctor Who fan. But if you've never read any Adams before, or if you're not into Doctor Who, then you probably want to start with, you know, with uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But still, glad I read it. Alrighty, just a quick little one to update you on today. I read The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebold. 
It was okay. I really didn't like the ending. Uh, there was a very strange bit at the end where... This is basically about a murdered girl who's watching like the investigation into her death from heaven. And then towards the end, she like possesses the body of her old friend so that she can have sex with the guy that she was in love with or whatever when she was a teenager. But it's just really weird. That was a very strange thing. And for me, that raised all kinds of weird, awkward, creepy questions about consent, which I wasn't too too happy about. But um, yeah, it's kind of okay. I mean, I think it's been called like a literary fiction, but it's not. It's kind of a fairly generic thriller, except a very slow-paced one as well. Uh, and actually, to me, read as though it was translated, but it wasn't. It's just she writes quite strangely. And again, as I say, that, that bit at the end really didn't work for me so overall I gave it a 3 out of 5 it was okay uh, I mean I guess I can understand why people like it I don't know though because someone said it used to be their favourite book and I'm like that seems a bit strange to me but um, I don't know because it just seems like I mean maybe it's because it's kind of an older book so there's so many books out now that are derivative of it but yeah it just wasn't it didn't grip me and that's about all I can say about it, I guess. I'm also going to be doing a full review of this as well, so I'll link to that below. Okay, up after that, I read Doris Ahoy by Charles Heathcote. So Charles Heathcote is here on BookTube. He's a good friend of mine. I'm actually working with him to edit his secret project. And this is book number 2.5 in the R. Doris series. And in this one, Doris and Harold go on a cruise. In fact, I'll read the blurb here. After recent traumatic events, Harold and Doris have embarked on a world cruise, hoping for rest and relaxation. Their plans are thwarted at every turn. There's the mystery surrounding the identity of Mrs. Veronica Ambrose and a dance competition that pits the pair of them against regional champion and trifle guzzler Ken. Told from the perspective of long-suffering husband Harold, he dreams of being back home, nursing a pint down the hare and horse. Instead, he's propping up a smoothie bar with health and fitness freak Percy, a man with an unnatural interest in kale. Doris Ahoy is the third book in a series of monologues featuring Mrs. Doris Copeland, a partridge muse. Charlie was originally thinking about publishing this just as like as an e extra in one of the Doris books, but then he realised it had kind of got on a life its, uh, of its own. And I'm glad that he did publish it in this format. I'm really glad to get to read it. I mean, the characters are just hilarious. So if you've read the other books in the series, you just get more of the same, which is a good thing. It's written with a very sort of dry northern sense of humour. And it's about this old couple, uh, Doris, who's very sort of... She wants to maintain her appearance in society and Harold, who is her, her long-suffering husband. So yeah, definitely enjoyed it. Would recommend 4.25 out of 5 and full review coming soon as part of Tarden Dane's Indie Read Along. Aloha! And today... Is, that's fine, we'll go with that. Alright, so I've got some more books. So here I have Sleeping Beauties by Stephen King and Owen King. This bad boy's like 730 pages and took me five days to read. I gave it a solid 4 out of 5 though, I thought it was excellent. It's kind of a spin on Sleeping Beauty. Now I don't normally like retellings, but I thought this was handled very well. And again, I really just enjoyed reading it. Uh, basically what happens is all the women on Earth, when they fall asleep, they start getting these like cocoons over their faces and then over their full bodies. And if you try and scrape that away, they kind of become rabid and attack people. And we learn in the second half, they kind of go into this other world beyond the tree. And they're kind of faced with this ultimate decision there. And so, meanwhile, we're tracking things like the sheriff, who is a woman, and she's trying to stay awake to keep order in the town, and, like, so she's raiding the lockers, there's, like, of the stashes they got from drug dealers and all this stuff. It's what King does really well, this sort of small town stuff, except I thought the ending was really good as well. And there was just lots of stuff here on gender that really made me think. I did a full review of this, so I will link to that if it's out. But, yeah, I've heard mixed things about this, but for me, I thought it was a hit. It could have been a little bit shorter, especially in the second half. But overall, it was a good one, and it's made me want to read some of Owen King's stuff now as well. Then, after that, I read Cannery Row by John Steinbeck. So this is a pretty famous novel. It's about a group of down-and-outs, uh, Dora, Hazel, Mary, Eddie, and, of course, Doc. And the other four, and the kind of lo the local community, are basically trying to throw a party for Doc. Um, like, none of them have any money. They're actually earning money from catching frogs for Doc. And then they try and throw him this party, and then he's like, he arrives home a day later, and so they all just get drunk and trash his house. So they try and throw another party to surprise him. And uh, it's one of those where the story doesn't really matter. Because this is really about the depiction of the place and the people. And as I say, again, it's about this group of down and outs. Which Steinbeck was really good about, uh, good at writing about. He's done it in other books. So yeah, I read this as a buddy read with Charles Heathcote. And I gave it a 4 out of 5. I started reading it as a bedtime book. Doing like 25 pages at a time. And in the end, I, just, I read it in one go after finishing, um, uh, finishing Stephen King. 
Then I picked up Over to You by Roald Dahl. So this is a collection of short stories that are all kind of set during the Second World War. They are, they are all actually fictional. So while some of them might be based on things you'd heard or seen or whatever, they, they're not necessarily. It's one of those, you know, all the places and circumstances in this are purely fictitious. Any resemblance to people living or dead is purely coincidental or whatever. Uh, I, I prefer personally reading Dahl's actual written non-fiction memoirs about the war, you know. But these were okay. I thought they were kind of slow at times. So there were like gun battles in the air, which I was bored during. And I'm like, surely this shouldn't even be possible. But um, yeah, some of the stories were good. Some of them not so good. There was one that was just had like supernatural elements, which I felt didn't really fit with the whole war vibe. But overall, it was interesting enough. Uh, and it's like one I'm glad I've ticked off on my list of reading every Roll Dahl book. So I gave it a 3.25 out of 5. Okay, then I read A Sweetheart by Peter James. And this is like a haunted house story, but it's also got uh, elements of like uh, hypnotism and past life regression and all that kind of thing. There are a lot of like the tropes and the cliches that you kind of associate with these, you know, haunted house stories. So you get this family moving and you see what the haunted place does to the family. And uh, you have this sort of thing of one person wants to leave, one person wants to stay and all that. But at the same time, it was entertaining and it was good for what it was. It wasn't like the best writing and Peter James has definitely matured as a writer between when he wrote this, which came out about 1990. And his, Peter, and his Roy Grace books, which are you know his main series that, that are out at the moment. But yeah, I'm kind of slowly working through all of Peter James's stuff and this was... It was alright, it was 3.5 out of 5. I think it's a good one to go for if you want to check out some of his work, but you're a horror reader, because this is definitely more just sort of supernatural horror than it than uh, crime, for example, which is, which is what he's really known as. But yeah, it was pretty good, 3.5 out of 5. Full review of that as well. Uh, I don't know if it's edited yet, but you know. And full review of these actually, so I read these three poetry books. So I'm just going to read you one poem from each of them to give you a feel for them. So we'll start with Bethany Rivers, The Sea Refuses No River. So the blurb for this one. In this collection, The Sea Refuses No River, there is a great acceptance of the painful memories as an integral part of the healing journey. To quote Adrienne Rich, I came to explore the wreck. And in this collection, Bethany discovers how the words are purposes, the words are maps. Uh, this, this book and the next two books were all sent to me by Fly on the Wall Press who published this as part of their poetry chapbook series and I read them and reviewed them for Tarden Day, the indie read along. Let's read Shape of Loss. Deserts as wide as 28 years, windswept sand dunes background to studies, graduation, marriage, cycling, rock climbing, badminton. Divorce, friendships found, friendships broken, seasons out of kilter, six seasons in one day. None of the men I've kissed ever saw the smiling daughter holding hands with her father. These desert days I carried the desert flowers forgotten. So yeah, I you know, enjoyed this, this uh, chapbook uh, 3.75 out of 5. It wasn't the best of the three though, because there were some others too. So uh, here we have The Woman with an Owl Tattoo by Al Anne Walsh Donnelly. And this is basically poetry that she wrote uh, in her 40s. She, you know, divorced her husband and discovered her sexuality. I'm not sure whether she was bisexual or, uh, or lesbian or, you know, whatever terms you want to use. But um, she talks about you know, all the coming out and the experiences she went through and stuff. So, for example, here we'll read uh, To My 50-Year-Old Self. Unclasp your bra, let it fall. Ease your comfy cotton knickers down your legs. Look at your naked self, untouched by another for seven years. Hold your breasts, watch them spill out of your hands. Run your thumbs along the curved water slide of your spine. Massage the hollow between your hips, smooth as a leaf in late summer. Cradle your belly. Admire the way it protrudes over greying hair, framed by the Y of your thighs. Play a sonata on your skin, stiffen your nipples, close your eyes. Dive into the dream of the fisherman's wife. And I thought she did a great job in this of you know, sharing her experience and the feelings that she went through in fairly simple language that made it very approachable. I gave this one a 4 out of 5. I think my biggest criticism is actually this cover, which I don't like for whatever reason. I, I just didn't didn't like the cover much. But um, yeah, if, if that's kind of your a subject matter that interests you, then definitely check it out. And then here we have Bad Mummy, Stay Mummy by Elizabeth Horan. And this is poetry about her experiences with um, postpartum depression. So I'm going to read out, let's go for small souls. 
Outside my window there is a huge raccoon who eats live chicks by the light of the moon. He taunts me, mean, as he plucks them clean, ice shards for teeth. Those chicks are my babies. It makes me weep to think how they suffered. I don't want to talk about what I should have done, how I should have run outside, how I should have grabbed the gun, how I should have run to you, how I should have brought the gun when you were suffering, I was suffering too. Afraid of the toilet, the witch that lived in it. If I shit, she would stick me with a needle. So anal retentive, I spent my young years holding the crap inside. Then I grew chubby, white and blubbery, breasts swollen as rotten melons. Then I got raped, eaten alive by a human coon, ice shards for teeth, by the light of a horrid post-dawn moon. I don't like what you're doing to me, I whimpered. Just a 16-year-old virgin on a downhill slide to last a lifetime. Who knew I would miss all those years I shit my pants? Those were the easy ones. Hell, those were the good times. Cause years get easy and flow together when the difficulty of life courses itself in and out of your eras. When you spend it wishing for difference, for the old days, the gentle ones, not quite as hard to bear. Now all I hope for is to live long enough, to help my children have good lives. It doesn't matter that I want to die. It's no longer about me. It's about the young children who are scared to go to the bathroom, who are scared of the dark, who are scared of angry parents that yell and they cower like storm-ravaged sunflowers. I am, I am, the evil ogre that should get locked up. But who then would stroke their ochre cheeks of suede at night as they risk the closing of their eyes and lay their small souls exposed to the evil teeth of the night? I whimper, good night, little ones. Mama's here, sleep tight. So as you can see, it's pretty powerful stuff. I think especially if you read it aloud, actually, that really captured it. But this was actually my favourite of the three that I was sent. I gave this one a 4.25 out of 5 and would heartily recommend it. Okay, after that I read The Caves of Steel by Isaac Asimov. So this is a robot novel. It's actually not as good as iRobot, um, but it does do some similar th things in terms of uh, investigating like the three laws of robotics. So in this, basically, uh, a human detective and a robot detective team up to investigate a murder. And so it's kind of like a futuristic sci-fi crime police procedural, really. I have filmed a full review of this, so again, I'll link to that if it's available. But overall, I enjoyed it. I wasn't a fan of this tiny print, which made it very difficult to read unless under a direct uh, light source. But yeah, I mean, I plan to slowly try and work my way through as much Asimov as possible, which is a big ask because he wrote a lot of books. But um, I'm enjoying my reading so far, and this was no exception. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. It's pretty good. Then I read this, which is Lily the Limpet Gets Lost by Emma Rosen and Eugenia Blackery. I read this for Tartan Danes, indie read along. And this is basically a children's book that Emma Rosen here on BookTube and AuthorTube worked on. And as you can see, it's got some beautiful illustrations, but it also has a really nice story about a limpet in a rock pool and basically it has a moral at the end reminding the kids to put the uh, put the limpets back now Billy said Gran I'm glad you had fun but there's one thing to do before we are done everything here must go back in the sea that's where they're safe and where they should be Billy was careful when he put the things back Gran helped him figure out just where they'd sat the shell in some seaweed the crab under a ledge and the stone in a deep pool just near the edge so yeah, I really enjoyed this. This was a four out of five. I mean, I'm obviously not the target audience for it, but especially for an uh, you know an indie indie release, I thought this was, you know, just really beautifully written. And then again, I really liked and appreciated the fact that it had that nice message about you know look after the animals. And then I read Time's Eye by Arthur C. Clarke and Stephen Baxter. So let me read the blurb for this one. 1885, the NW frontier. Rudyard Kipling witnesses a bizarre encounter between the British Army and a piece of impossibly advanced technology, a hovering sphere mysteriously watchful, and then, shockingly, a helicopter from 2037 comes over the hill. Meanwhile, elsewhere, scouts from the great horde of Genghis Khan find that familiar landmarks on the great steppe have disappeared, as if they'd never been. And elsewhere again, the courtiers of Alexander the Great wait anxiously for news of the great king, who seems to have vanished. Nothing is as it was. The castaways in time must make an epic journey across a transformed world, a journey to a devastating truth. For if history is long, our future may be shorter than any of us have dreamed. Mankind's odyssey in time has begun. So you'd think that with Arthur C. Clarke and Stephen Baxter's names addressed to this, uh, attached to this, combined with that blurb, that it would be good. Unfortunately, it wasn't. It had a lot of like pacing issues and just generally was quite uninteresting. Uh, I, I'm disappointed. I mean, I picked it up in a charity shop after... I've already read Arthur C. Clarke in the past, and I recently read Stephen Baxter's uh, Long Earth books that he wrote with Terry Pratchett, because obviously I'm a Pratchett fan. And I really enjoyed those, so I was hoping these would be in a similar vein, but alas, not 
Not very good. Three out of five, I'm afraid. Would not recommend. Alright, are we ready? I have a bunch more books. So we're going to start off here with Catch Me If You Can by Frank W. Abagnale and Stan Redding. So you may be familiar with this if you've seen the movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. Gotta say, I kind of put this off not just because of the movie cover, but also because the print in it's tiny. But once I did pick it up and get into it, it was very hard to put down. It's non-fiction about Abagnale when he was a kid. He was like a teenager and posing as a pilot in his late 20s and stuff. He also posed as a lawyer, a doctor, various other things. Did a lot of writing and bad checks. And this kind of is his chronicles of those exploits. But it's really fascinating because you get to see not only his inventiveness and how he gamed the system in these different ways, but also like human gullibility and, and how gullible people can be. So yeah, despite putting this off for quite a long time, I really enjoyed it. I gave it a 4 out of 5 and would definitely recommend it if you've seen the film and enjoyed it. And to be honest, you don't need to have seen the film to read the book. And the book as a sort of standalone thing of non-fiction is, is definitely worth reading. So yeah, check it out. Then I went for some Bizarro. So I read Gay Zombie Sluts in Key West by Mandy DeSandra. And the premise of this is basically that there is a zombie apocalypse and the only cure for humanity is to let these zombies have anal sex with this guy uh, because he's like got a, an immunity to it. It's bizarro erotica fiction. Super weird, but I did kind of enjoy it. It wasn't as good as Fox News Fuckfest, which Mandy DeSandra has also written, but it was still fun. And like, I know the person who's behind Mandy DeSandra as well. So, uh, you know, that was interesting. They had like a self-reference in it at one point that you wouldn't know unless you knew who Mandy DeSandra was, I guess. But it's, like, not really a secret. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, 3.5 out of 5 for this one. Quick read as well. Then we have Paroxysm of Fear, Volume 1 by Todd Wittenmeyer. So I was sent this by Time for Books. And this is Todd as in Todd the Librarian. And we have, I think it's six short stories in this. And what I think with Todd is that um, he's really good with the ideas and the concepts behind stories. So this is kind of cool because you get more of the concepts across in a short story collection. There are some formatting issues, and like at one point a word was missing entirely, and there are a few like apostrophe and weird grammar things and whatnot. But for indie, it was pretty good. Uh, I gave it like a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5. And yeah, again, I think the main things here were like, as I say, thinking thinking about the, the stories themselves, thinking about the kind of concepts they served up. In the uh, there was one story about a man who was like adrift after a shipwreck, and he was like beating people like with a wooden thing to keep them away from his like flotation thing because he didn't want them all to get dragged under. So that kind of makes you think, what would I do in that situation? So yeah, pretty cool. As with any short story collection, there are some stories better than others, but overall worth reading. Then I read another Bizarro novel. So this is Ass Goblins of Auschwitz by Cameron Pierce, and this was actually sent to me by Time for Books as well. I think this was accidentally sent to her when she ordered some other book, and she just thought, you know, who would like this? Dane would like this. And she was right, I did enjoy it. I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. It's basically about this alien race of ass goblins, who uh, are like kidnapping kids from this kid planet. What's it called? Kid Topia? Kid Land, that's it. Uh, we follow two characters who are like uh, conjoined twins, basically. And, uh, you know, these ass goblins are doing all kinds of weird experiments on them. So it draws parallels, obviously, with uh, the Nazis. But actually, it's oddly touching in places with some of the different things that happen, some of the different moral issues that arise. But at the same time, it's just sort of wacky, zany, crazy, and super weird. But I think you know i think people can be touchy around subjects like the holocaust and with good reason you know um i mean i like to think people watching my videos know that i'm a fairly reasonable person i guess and like i don't see anything wrong with writing about subjects like this and just putting a different spin on it i mean i don't think any subject matter should be off limit for arts for comedy and all that kind of stuff but i think it was also tastefully done so it's like you know what i mean i think people should have the freedom to write about what they want, but if they write something really crappy about a really important subject, then they're going to come under fire for it, you know? But I don't think this was crappy. I think it was pretty good for uh, for bizarro fiction. So yeah, 3.75 out of 5. Then I read Loud Silence by Hedy Mix, and this is basically like a little mini anthology that came with this new uh, like bookish subscription service. I'll actually link to this below, and all reviews for as many of these books, because I did the bizarro and some of the Indian stuff. But um, yeah, 
so this came as part of that box set. It was the first ever one, and the idea behind this box set is to like champion authors from underrepresented communities, whether it's LGBTQ+, whatever. Uh, this one it is uh, deaf people and the deaf community, and we have a mixture of like fiction and then some essays as well, but it's interesting how like the fiction and the essays almost interrelate and cover similar issues. Uh, the essays I thought was interesting because they keep referring back to the same source material. And the reason for that is because there's just not that much stuff written about or especially written by deaf people. And some of the essays even look into why that is. There's one that looks into like cochlear implants and the way that um, that's perceived in society. And so, yeah, I actually thought the essays were more interesting than the fiction that was included in here. But uh, I'll, I've done a full review of this and an unboxing for this as well. So I'll link to that below. Four out of five. Very good. Not sure if it's available outside the box set, though. Then we have Wrapped Up in Nothing, which is a Mr. Blank story by Ollie Jacobs. And basically, Mr. Blank, he kind of wakes up in the middle of this desert, in this like almost like this post-apocalyptic desert. It reminded me of uh, the Gunslinger books by Stephen King, the Dark Tower series. But uh, yeah, he's got like half his face missing. He has no tongue. He's covered in bandages, and he has no idea who he was or how he got there. And we kind of investigate that in this and he kind of learns a bit more about his origins and I believe they're going to be continued in a later novel. This is one of Jacobs's more recent-ish ones. I think it's 2016, so it's not super recent, but um, you can kind of see how his writing style has evolved, or at least I can because I've read enough of his work. And I really enjoyed this one. It's um, a difficult one to summarise in terms of the plot, but uh, it's more of a character study of Mr. Blank. And you learn how he got his name and all this other stuff. Like he has to write messages out on a mobile phone or on like a pad and paper and stuff because he doesn't have a tongue. And yeah, I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. This was reviewed along with a lot of these others as part of Tarden Dane's Indie Read Along. Then we have Asimov's Mysteries by Isaac Asimov. So this actually started out as a bedtime book. I got about halfway through and then lost my copy somehow. But um, when I reordered it, it actually came with larger print. But also, I was enjoying it so much, I was planning to like substitute it out as a main book anyway. So I did. Uh, a few of the stories in this I have come across before, including one which is literally it's about a three-page story that Asimov wrote specifically to get a pun in there. Uh, these are interesting because they're like short stories, but they're science fiction mysteries. So um, it actually says on the front a quote from The Observer. It's the first time I've seen science fiction used this way. As with most short stories, again, you have ones that you enjoy more than others. But overall, I thought it was pretty cool. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. I did enjoy more uh, A Whiff of Death, which was actually like a sci fi Well, it's not really science fiction. It was more like a science-based detective novel based on like an American campus when a scientist gets murdered. So I would say if you're interested in checking out some of Asimov's uh, detective, like crime, fi uh, whatever you want to call it, cozy detective stuff check that out but um this was cool as well i gave this a 3.5 out of 5 and i'm glad i uh, ticked it off and then we have wide sargasso c by jean reese so i've read some of jean reese before she was part of the penguin mini modern box set that i read and i enjoyed what i read in there i didn't re enjoy this so much uh, part of that i think is because it's like inspired by jane eyre by charlotte bronte and i haven't read that so i think if i had read that i would have appreciated this more but also I have no like pressing desire to read that and like that subject matter for me just isn't interesting. So the best part of this was actually that a lot of the dialogue was written in like Jamaican Patois. So that was quite cool. It was probably easier to read than like Irvin Welsh's stuff. Um, but also it was kind of cha a challenge to sort of decipher what they were saying. But it was like I enjoyed reading the conversations more than the actual subject matter of the conversation. Like they could have been saying anything because I just totally wasn't taking in what they were saying, just the way they were saying it. So yeah, I gave this a 2.5 out of 5. It just wasn't for me, but I do totally appreciate its importance. And I can also see why, for other people, they would enjoy it. Hello, it is me, your friendly neighbourhood booktuber. And today I have three more books to talk to you about. So, we start with this one, which is Beer Makes Daddy Strong by Andy Riley. So, he is the author of Great Lies to Tell Small Kids, and in this we have things like, you know, shopping is not something daddy regards as a leisure activity in its own right. And these little illustrations and stuff. He also did The Bunny Suicides, which is why I basically got this, because I really enjoyed The Bunny Suicides. This is just basically a gimmicky little book. It'd be a good gift for, like, Father's Day or something. I don't have kids, so I didn't really relate to a lot of it. I also didn't have a particularly good relationship with my dad a lot of the time, so, yeah. But yeah, I give it a 3 out of 5. It is what it is. 
Then I... Th my pillows are falling on me. Stop it. Then I read Whose Body by Dorothy L. Sayers. So, basically, obviously, Dorothy L. Sayers is a super well-known, well-respected author. So I went into this basically expecting she might become a new favourite author. I was expecting something along the lines of Agatha Christie. But for me, it was more like, um, I always forget his name, P.G. Woodhouse and, like, the Jeeves and Worcester books, which I just didn't enjoy. This is actually the first Lord Peter Whimsey mystery, but for me, I didn't really like Peter Whimsey as a character. Like, the writing itself was okay, the setting was fine, the mystery was fine. It was just all around, like, pretty average for me. And I was expecting so much more, which for me was a shame. There are also quite a few mistakes in this. Bearing in mind, this is Dorothy L. Sayers, and it's published by Hodder, and you would think they would have picked up on these. There were, like, I think there was one, like, wrong version of your or something, and, like, a couple of missing punctuation marks, and it just really confused me. But, um... Yeah, it was uh, three out of five for me. Um, nothing special, unfortunately. And, you know, now I'm a little bit hesitant about reading more Dorothy L. Sayers, but I'm sure I will at some point. And then I read Beat Poets, and this is the Everyman's Library Pocket Poets edition and edited by Catalina Ciuraru. I don't know, it's very hard to pronounce. And this is just a collection of different beat poetry. A lot of it I'd read before. For example, there's America by Allen Ginsberg in this, which I know off by heart. There's Howl, which I've read a bunch of times. There's a lot of Jack Kerouac in here. There's some Frank O'Hara. But then there's also things like uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Gregory Corso. Quite a few women as well, which was quite interesting. And, I mean, I love beat poetry. It's probably my favourite kind of poetry. So I gave this a four out of five. I think the only thing that I could have that it could have improved on was that it could have introduced me to more new poetry but that's hardly a fault of this because it's very much like an introduction to the genre and if you if you're new to beat poetry and you want to discover more definitely a good one to go for again it's a really nice addition it's even got this little this little ribbon in it for keeping your page all right i got another quick update for you so i read from the mouth of the whale by sean sean is an icelandic author actually known for collaborating with bjork as well and you can kind of see that similarity because they're both just nuts this one here is kind of like a fairy tale mixed with a fantasy, mixed with historical fiction, mixed with Moby Dick, mixed with like literary fiction, just everything, magical realism, it's all thrown in there. I'm going to read the blurb because I couldn't tell you what this is about. Even when I was reading it, I couldn't have told you what it was about. But the good thing is it's one of those books where it doesn't really matter. Like, the main thing I took away from this is the way that it made me feel. And I think if you look back at a book and you can remember how it made you feel, that's a good thing. Uh, so yeah. The year is 1635. Iceland is a world darkened by superstition, poverty and cruelty. Men of science marvel over a unicorn's horn. Poor folk worship the virgin in secret and both books and men are burnt. Jonas Palmerson, a poet and self-taught healer, has been condemned to exile for heretical conduct, having fallen foul of the local magistrate. Banished to a barren island, Jonas recalls his exorcism of a walking corpse on the remote Snafjold coast, the frenzied massacre of innocent Basque whalers at the hands of local villagers and the deaths of three of his children. From the mouth of the whale is a vanished evocation of an enlightened mind and a vanished age. And uh, yeah, I mean it was awesome. I would definitely recommend reading it. It was like a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5 for me. Um, I couldn't give it higher just because again it was such a strange experience. It also has lots of these paragraphs that literally go over like multiple pages. But um, yeah, there's just something about the writing and maybe the translation of it as well. That just made it really magical and really enjoyable to read it. And uh, this is my second Sean book after The Blue Fox. And I managed to get both of these from charity shops, which I'm pretty stoked about. So I'm going to keep my eyes peeled and see if I can get to more of, more of Sean's stuff in the future. Okay, I've got another book to update you guys on. It is Prediction Machines by Ajay Agrawal, Joshua Gans, and Avi Goldfarb. The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence. Basically, the idea is that the way that artificial intelligence works is that it makes predictions. As you can guess, this is non-fiction. It's by Harvard Business Review Press. So, say I are AI making predictions. What are you doing, Biggie? You're standing on my sign. Thank you. Let me put that back. So, uh, for example, self-driving cars use AI to determine what routes to take. And uh, the idea is, is that they don't like get programmed for every possible scenario. They observe human drivers as they drive around. And then they then kind of make inferences based on, um, you know, what would a human driver do in this situation? Basically, they're predicting what would a human driver do? And other systems like Netflix is predicting whether you might like a show. Um, Amazon's recommendations, uh, again, predicting things that you might like to buy. They actually talk, the authors in this, they talk about a potential new business model. And Amazon has taken out a, um, a pattern for this, 
where they could potentially ship things to you because their predictions based on what you might need are so good that they're like right 90 plus percent of the time and they could ship things out to people and then just collect any un unwanted items once a week and it's just a more proactive way of selling so I thought that was interesting. There's also some stuff about the healthcare industry in this which for me kind of made it worth reading. This was actually uh, recommended to me by a client of mine who is called Emmanuel Fombu MD who's written a book called uh, the future of healthcare and he's also working on one called predictive medicine which covers AI in healthcare so he'd recommended this to me about a year ago finally got to it and I can't believe I put it off for so long it's super readable it looks dense but actually it's not too bad it's about 220 pages and then the rest are like notes and, and an in index and all in all if you're looking for a book that's going to tell you kind of every, pretty much everything you could want to know about AI and uh, predictive computing this is the one to read so I gave it a 4 out of 5 and it was also made more interesting by the fact that I'm kind of simultaneously I've been reading Alan Turing's biography as my uh, bedtime book as well so uh, yeah that was cool for like the two different sides of computing and whatnot to come together. Okay so up next I read Possession by Peter James. This is like a sort of haunted house slash ghost story. It's actually very similar to Sweetheart which I read previously. Sweetheart had themes of like past life regression. In this one we have mediums and we also look at Christianity. Both written and published around about the same time in about 1988, uh, 1990. I think this was the first of the two to come out but this is the one I'd recommend the most out of the two. I mean it's just fine. It's not anything mind-blowing but it's pretty good if you just want something you can read and switch your mind off and just enjoy for the sheer sheer hell of it, you know. I have done a full review of this as well which I'll link to below if that's out. But overall, yeah, this was it was it was a I I gave it a uh, 3.5 out of 5, but uh on a generous day I might even give it a 3.75 out of 5. And then I read Snowpiercer by Lob and Rochette. I don't know if it says exactly what their names are anywhere. Convenient. Um, this graphic novel inspired a movie which I haven't seen. I actually think I heard about this on BookTube but I can't remember who talked about it. This is volume one of three and what's interesting is I think they had different people, right? All three of them. And uh, yeah, I did enjoy it. I'm going to be reading the rest of the series for sure. It's basically a graphic novel series that's like a post-apocalyptic thing set on this train. Uh, and there are a thousand one carriages there and there are like different social levels depending upon whereabouts in the train you are. So like first class, second class, third class, etc. And it kind of investigates all that while dealing with this like post-apocalyptic situation. And yeah, uh, I think it was translated from French and there were a few moments where there were some strange wording choices. But overall, I was pretty impressed by it. I gave it a 4.5 and we'll be continuing. Alright, so I finished another one. This is The Golden One, Blooming by Hans M. Hershey. So this is part one in a trilogy of YA fantasy novels. Hans actually reached out and sent these to me. I've read some of his stuff before. He's an indie author. And he asked me if I wanted to read the third book in the series. And I was like, well, I haven't read the other two. Can, do you want to just send me the first one? And he ended up sending me all three, which is very nice of him. As you can tell from the title, this kind of plays with the, the Chosen One trope. Uh, the Chosen One in this case is sort of your teenage boy protagonist. Um, there's some LGBTQ themes in here as well, but really it's not that important to the story, which I, I think is good because I, I don't really like romance, so, you know. Um, and basically this kid can turn into like a golden butterfly, and these butterflies have only ever appeared when there's like a major event. So for example, one of them has appeared uh, over the deploy button on a nuclear bomb to stop a third bomb being dropped during the Second World War. And, uh, yeah, this kid has to kind of save the environment from fracking, basically. And I really like that. I thought it was really cool that it kind of addressed these issues and put them in a way that, you know, young adults can understand them, I guess. And, uh, yeah, all in all, I thought it was a pretty good effort. It's not a genre I'd usually read, but it certainly kept me reading from, from cover to cover. I read the whole thing in, like, I don't know, 12 hours or something. So um, over a 12-hour period, not 12 hours of, of total reading quite a short one so yeah I enjoyed this and I'm looking forward to getting to the next one I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 all right I've got two more books for you here I have here the golden one deceit by Hans M Hershey so this is the follow-up to the first golden one book and obviously the bridge between the third one the third one's recently come out and if the first one of these books focused very much on an external threat like oil companies coming to town and the golden one and her animal fr and his animal friends after like get rid of this oil company basically and in this one it's very much an internal threat so we have the Osana which is like this I guess this tribal um, council over the what they call the Beyonsin who are like the, the human beings who can transform into animals and it's their job to kind of protect mother nature 
So in the first one, obviously, they're protecting against this threat of the, the drilling. But in this one, it is very much an internal threat. And there's like a power struggle at the top of the Osana. And uh, the Osana, Obana, Obana, because it reminded me of a... Oh, it's Ohana. There we go. It just reminds me of Osama Bin Laden and Barack Obama. But um, yeah, it was interesting to have this sort of different take on it. I think there was a lot more... Not necessarily that the stakes were higher, but... Um, there were more elements, so in the first one it was kind of protecting nature and and uh, the town, whereas in this one it's protecting the whole world and also Jason has to protect his family. You know, a few deaths in here, we discover some more skills that Jason has as the golden one. Uh, he gets his name from pretty much being the chosen one, he transforms into a butterfly. And yeah, I mean, it's not really my kind of thing that I would, I would normally read, but I think if anything I probably pr preferred this second one to the first one. I'm going to give it another 3.5 out of 5, which is what I give to like a, just a professional quality book. And yeah, there'll be a full review of the series coming soon. So that brings me on to Planet in Peril, an anthology for our time, edited by Isabel Kenyon. Basically, Kenyon is a poet. She's also the founder of Fly on the Wall Poetry Press. And this brings together like poetry, but also art and photography. And it's all dedicated to the planet, you know. And uh, there's even proceeds from it go to uh, nature charities. Huge variety of different types of poetry. There's also like a platform here for younger poets. So there's a section near the end of, you know, poets below the age of 18, which I think is particularly important for something like this when you know, you're talking about our planet and it is the younger poets who, you know, this is going to have the effect on, really. We're screwing up the planet for the future and we all know it and we never do anything about it as well. I'm going to read Yesterday is Too Late. This is the poem by Isabel Kenyon who pulls this together. Also, I'm going to read this here, this uh, this photo of the, the monkey here. It's called Our Problem with Plastic by Ellen Doherty, winner of the Planet in Peril competition photography category. Ellen said this photo was captured in Yubud's sacred monkey forest in Bali, Indonesia. An urban monkey chews on a piece of plastic left by a tourist. Bali is an increasingly popular holiday destination, but it's slowly drowning in plastic and its wildlife is suffering the consequences. So I'm going to read Yesterday is Too Late. Yesterday, toasted rock-roasted Brits were like geckos, tongs in tepid ales, flapping over screens. Yesterday, Notre Dame wept fiery tears for the giant Yangtze turtle, functionally extinct. Yesterday, young people skipped school for their future. Leaders denied climate change. Yesterday, bittersweet heat, breathing fresh fumes and dry skin, with babies, mums, pensioners, teens, working, sharing space in a polluted city, which claims asthmatic residents. Yesterday, bittersweet heat, deserts formed for cotton clothes. Brazil wept CO2 skywards. Forest lungs wheezed and oceans boiled over rooftops, hands flailing in the tide. Today, outliving Earth's means, we scrabble for yesterdays. Stammer apologies to tomorrow's. So yeah, very important book. This smells nice as well. It's got that new book smell. I just got a waft of it. I think this is a 4.5 out of 5 and would strongly recommend, especially if you're interested in either photography or poetry. It would make a good coffee table book or, or equally just do what I did and read it from cover to cover, you know? Yeah, strongly recommended. All right, one last thing to talk about. I'm wearing a hat because my hair is wet. So, you know, this is issue one of Creature, which is like a little local zine. It's uh, main contents really are this interview with MCM, who is a rapper. Um, but we also have some other cool stuff like some art, uh, this kind of stuff. So I picked this up from my local art centre just because I saw it and, um, you know, it's cool. I gave it a uh, 3.75 out of 5, I believe. I like this as well. Like This is like a little graphic novel told without images. So that's very cool. But as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.